Hello. Well, hey there. How you doing? You know, I'm I'm doing really good. Good. We're matching today. Yeah. Well, but thank you for coming. A, uh, yeah, no problem. Zach, if you want to take it away. This is Zach. He's our VP, so he's going to be doing the interview today for you. All right, no problem. Zach, what's up? How's it going? Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight for our first day in the life event um, for 2021. Tonight, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Michael Musatson, a DO from MSU. He earned his degree at MSU in 2000. He's been board certified orthopedic surgeon since 2007, and he owns his own private practice in Mount Pleasant. He also works as a team surgeon for the Central Michigan University Athletics. So thank you everyone for having him, um, for coming out tonight. And thank you, Dr. Musatsen for coming out. Also thank you OMSP and Business and Medicine for co-sponsoring this event tonight. Nice. So uh, thanks for having me. Actually back in, I, I almost hate to think how long ago it was when I was in medical school, but I was actually president of the surgery club. So uh, I remember what it was like to try to get people to come and talk to you. And it was, uh, so I'm happy to help you guys out. Um, you guys, um, medicine's pretty exciting you guys gotta so well we appreciate you having you here yeah. so i'm basically just gonna ask you some questions and uh, just kind of yeah, like, tell us about how your day day in life works so to start yeah. out um what's your hometown okay, you i'm from? in mount pleasant michigan so um it's right in the middle of the state i don't know how familiar you are with the state of michigan but about an hour north of where you guys are um <laughs> Actually, I grew up in Mount Pleasant, graduated from Mount Pleasant High School. When I left, I thought I'd never be back. Um, I went to Michigan State for undergrad and for medical school. Um, and then there was just, I trained at, um, <clears throat> at Genesis Regional Medical Center in Grand Blanc. That's uh, where I did, that was my quote unquote base hospital. And then I ended up staying, I did internship there and then stayed on to do orthopedics. Um, and so I left there and came back here in 2005. Um, my wife uh, practices internal medicine. She graduated, she finished medical school in, uh, geez, I guess it was 2001. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it's all good. So um, I joined a private practice. Um, there, there was uh, two surgeons that were here, uh, Tom Keating and Charles Lilly. Um, we, the practice is central Michigan orthopedics. Uh, I've been in private practice my entire career. Um, I'm a bit of a dinosaur now, um, just by, in the sense that it's not common, um, to have a small, uh, kind of private practice as part of bigger groups. Um, and there's some uh, good reasons for that. Cause there's a lot of infrastructure you need and there's a lot of costs of doing business. They, they're better shared and spread over multiple people. Um, but, uh, be that as made, it's been a good deal here. Um, I, um, you know, I do general orthopedics, so I basically do everything but spine. Uh, I had, a, I, I enjoy trauma. I was pretty close to doing a trauma fellowship when I was finishing my training, but d chose not to, um, and just went into practice. Uh, but I do a lot of trauma, a lot of total hips, total knees, uh, a lot of sports medicine. Uh, it, it depends on how you define sports medicine. I mean, arthroscopic rotator cuffs, labor repairs, uh, ACLs, uh, you know, knee arthroscopies, that kind of stuff. Um, I've sort of over time kind of tapered my practice to, to the way I like to phrase it, just do what I enjoy. Um, so for instance, say if a flexor tendon repair comes in, I might see two or three of those a year. So I got a friend in Grand Rapids, it's one of the best hand surgeons in the country. So I send it to him rather than me do it. It's not that I can't do it, but I just, I don't feel like I do enough of it to where uh, I feel like I'm better than he is. So, of course. Um, but that's the, that's what's kind of nice about being in a, in a specialty like orthopedics. You kind of fine tune what you enjoy. And um, I think that's a real key kind of for you guys where you sit is what I always tell students when I talk to them, figure out a way to get paid to do what you enjoy. Uh, kind of simple. I mean, it sounds simple, but I think it's really important. Um, because you're going to, I don't care what you go into in medicine, you're going to work really hard. Uh, but it's also very rewarding, but you want to make sure that you like what you do. You know, if when your feet hit the floor in the mornings, if it's, you feel like you're going out to make, you know, time to make the donuts and, you know, you just feel miserable because you hate your job and then you're going to be a miserable person. You know, if you, cause there's, there's a lot of bullshit you got to deal with 
and uh, you can tolerate the bullshit a lot better when you actually get to do what you like. Um, you know, I, re I really enjoy doing surgery. Um, it, it, what's nice about orthopedics is you really help people. It's problem focused. Um, they're episodes of care. So by that, I mean, like you might come to see me because you have an ankle fracture. Uh, and then that's, but then, you know, two, three years down the road, you might have another problem. So you come back and see me, or you might choose to see somebody different. Um, but it's different from primary care where like you develop these relationships with single patients over time, you know? Um, so it's, it's a little different paradigm, but. So what got you into um, orthopedic surgery? What made you uh, you know, I was, like I said, I was president of the surgery club. So I used to work back in, I uh, started working at Ingham Medical Center or it's, it's McLaren Lansing area now or whatever. In 1990, I worked in the emergency department. Um, so I went to medical school. I knew I wanted to do some kind of surgery. I, I always tell students, I think it's important to figure out if you want to do medicine or surgery, kind of, you know, kind of broad category because they're very different animals. So it doesn't, I don't think it's so important to identify early what kind of surgery you might want to do. Uh, but I think it is important to identify early if you want to do surgery, you know, or if you want to do medicine, because they're just, they're just different animals. Um, yeah, but I, I knew I want to do some kind of surgery. When I got to the base hospitals, I, I started going to the orthopedic uh, meetings because uh, there's a concept where they call FaceTime, you know, because they're very competitive residencies. So you want to make sure that um, they get to know you and you're around at the meeting. So I started doing that early and the more I kind of learned about it, went to it, I really liked it. I, I love general surgery, um, tremendous amount of respect for it, but it really came down to choice for me. It's a lifestyle. I mean, general, general surgeons work their asses off um, and the orthopedics seemed like a little better lifestyle as well. And, and I really liked it. Um, but I, I also love general surgery too. So, I mean, really any kind of surgery, getting your hands dirty is pretty great. So. Uh, but when you're operating, it's nice because you're just in a, in a zone, you're focused on the task at hand and, um, you know, the operating room is a pretty special place. Uh, where, where did you end up doing your residency at? At Genesis Regional Medical Center in Grand Blanc. Okay. Um, how, how many like other um, people were in your residency program, if you like, how many slots? We were had there? Three per year. Well, they used to have two and then they um, increased it to three. Um, starting the year I was there, so it changed. So it's a five-year residency. Do you, know, do you by chance know how many people like applied for that residency with you? Nope. Or? No clue. But um, it's orthopedics is historically and classically very competitive. Um, so uh, it depends on where you want to go and what you want to do. Um, but it's uh, a lot of the surgical specialties are a lot more competitive. Um, it's just kind of how it is you know there's uh, but raw numbers I, I don't really have that for you but it, it's uh, there's plenty of qualified candidates that are also applying so um would you be able to lead us through like a typical day for you like what happens when you show up to work yeah so my the way i've set up my office is that uh i'm in the office monday wednesday fridays um so i'm there mondays all day uh pretty much packed i've I've evolved over time to kind of taper my week. I, I, two of my best friends are dentists and they don't work on Fridays. So I got tired of them sending me pictures of beers from the golf course. So as the week kind of goes on, I try to be smarter about how I work because it's I, I like the phrase, like it's a marathon, not a sprint. So Mondays, um, you know, I start the office at eight, eight in the morning. Uh, I'm very adamant about working out um, during lunchtime. Uh, I've done the five in the morning workout thing and I've got three kids. So if any of you have kids um, to, to show up at home at five at night and say, Hey, I'm going to go work out. Uh, it can be a little bristly, you know, that doesn't go well with your spouse. <laughs> so, uh, at, or, or it's not fair to your kids either. So, but what I found if I take that time at lunch uh, to, to work out, it really kind of reinvigorates me for the afternoon. Um, I'll either go work out at a gym in town or go for a run or do whatever, I've got a shower in my office so I can still wear a shirt and tie and do that stuff. But I think that's really important to integrate some kind of fitness into your day or something that is a way to relieve some stress. I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be exercise, but there's no ceiling to the hard work. And so if you spend your lunch 
filled up with talking to reps or doing the other stuff, you know, the next thing you know, you're working from sun up to sundown and you can burn out. And so I think it's, uh, it, it can be difficult. Tuesdays, I do my inpatient surgeries. So the total hips, total knees, the kind of the so-called bigger cases. Wednesday morning, I'm in the office. And then in the afternoon, um, I do some independent medical exams. For the last probably four or five years, I started doing those. Um, it's just they're either like work comp cases or um, auto accident cases. Um, it's just um, basically they'll come, a, a patient will come in and you kind of do an exam, you write up a medical report, but it's more of a business decision to do that because it actually pays pretty well and you don't have to provide any care for them. You just kind of, you know, uh, get a, you know, review their medical records, uh, get a good history in the physical area, you know, do a good consultation, then you write up a report. Then Thursday, I'm in the operating room. Um, that's where I'll do my, you know, outpatient stuff, you know, hand cases, um, you know, shoulder scopes, knee scopes, that kind of stuff. And then I'm in the office Friday morning, but I'm only there from like nine to about 1130. Um, I started that because I would take my kids to school in the morning on Fridays. Um, and then I call it follow up Fridays. So the only patients I see on Fridays are follow up. So they're either already I'm providing fracture care. I've already operated on them so that they're, it's a little faster. And if I'm seeing a new patient on those days, it's, it's somebody, I know why they're there. Um, Cause the new patients take kind of more work up and more, sort of meant it's more bandwidth if you will and then friday afternoons i try to leave for more administrative time um but i'll probably evolve again this is more because of my dentist friends um i'm going to try to probably drop fridays um uh, you know start you know starting the summer this summer and then work to to doing that because i'm trying to figure out how to work smarter um there's really a sweet spot um you know where i you know, want to maintain my productivity but you can kind of pass that sweet spot where you're really spending more hours, you're working harder, but there's not really uh, any, anything to be gained from it. You know, you don't like make a lot more money. You basically just pay more taxes, more headaches. And, and there's a threshold where it's just not worth it, you know? So I'm trying to really focus on the work life balance stuff. Got you can get kind of lost in the weeds and medicine's a, um, a field that you can get real busy for, you know, the hours can be very long. It's a, uh, you know, mentally taxing because it's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into it. You're, you're on all the time because you have to talk to patients, um, you know, there and it, it, it's totally correct. I mean, they expect you to, um, you know, and now they're rating how their experience is with you. You know what I mean? So you're kind of on all the time. So that's in that, but that comes at a price too. So, you know, it's nice when you're not at work, <laughs> you want to have some time to relax too, you know? understandable yeah, no. yeah and i'm on call um i used to be on every other week but now we've got um we've got my senior partner his son came and joined our practice a couple of years ago and then there's another surgeon in town so now it's one every four weeks so it's really calls not too bad um knock on wood but it's uh you know i mean in a smaller town we might um it's not all that onerous you know you might get called in once or twice a week but uh not too big a deal and um, do you have any favorite cases that you've worked on over the years? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like I said earlier, I ba basically do what I enjoy. So most of the stuff that I'm doing, I, I really like to do. You know, total hips, total knees. Uh, knee scopes are a lot of fun. Um, shoulder scopes, uh, they're fun. I enjoy doing those. Um, you know, I am, as you know, I've been in practice, Jesus. 15 years now. So, you know, as I've evolved in practice, kind of taper to, you know, I'm just basically doing stuff I really like, which is great. And it's nice being an independent practice because I don't, you know, if I don't want to work, I don't need to, but I've only got myself to blame. Um, you know, uh, you, you have some, a lot more autonomy in private practice. Um, but orthopedics is great because there's a whole lot of different facets to it. Um, you know, there's, some people might like doing some different stuff and that's cool, but I think you just kind of find what you enjoy and you, you get good at it and it makes it fun to go to work. And uh, what kind of advice do you have for people considering orthopedics who are in medical school right now? I, you know, I really think just, 
Um, the, the, the thing that's really important in orthopedics is don't be singular in focus. Uh, and by that, I mean, because, you know, everyone's going to, if, if you're quote unquote gunning for orthopedics, right? You got to be careful because when you're on other services, you want to make sure that you're doing a great job on those. So, you know, when you're on pediatrics, make sure you're reading pediatrics, make sure you're doing the best job you can because, you know, the, the world's not that big a place. So if, if all you're doing is running off and shirking your responsibilities of the service you're on to go to orthopedics, people hear about that and they talk to your program directors and those kind of things. So your best plan is just, you know, when, when you're off service, use that time to kind of get the face time on orthopedics. Um, but the other reality is too, you're a doctor and it's good to know those things because I will tell you, people come to me and they'll ask questions about, um, you know, something in medicine or, you know, cause they think I'm supposed, you know, they're like, well, you're a doctor. So they think you understand, you know what I mean? I'm like, shit, I didn't, I haven't thought about that for 15 years. You know what I mean? Like orthopedics is my wheelhouse, but nephrology, not so much, but it was great. I did a nephrology rotation as a, um, intern and as a student, I'll tell you, that's, you talk about, you want to learn some medicine, make sure you do a nephrology rotation. Great stuff. Cause it's a black box and it's, it's really kind of center mass for medicine, but it's important you learn those things. Um, not that you'll use it if you do orthopedics necessary, but, um, take advantage of the time you have, you know, you're, you're going to spend the rest of your life doing orthopedics when you got time to learn about the other stuff, you know, you're going to have kids. So it'd be important to understand pediatrics. You know, you're going to have people in your family that'll ask you questions about, you know, general medicine. It's important, you know, and understand about those things. Understandable. Uh, now, when you were applying for residencies, your, um, I guess you could say resume, as you will, would, did you say you had like a lot of research um, well, involved prior? It, it depends. I mean, the, the hard part in a competitive residency, and, you know, orthopedics is one of them, but there's other ones. Say if you want to do neurosurgery or ENT or whatever it is. I mean, there's some boxes that everybody's going to check, right? Everybody's going to have good grades. Everyone's going to have uh, good board scores. So you really, I, what I think the best thing you do is try to figure out ways to kind of get a personal relationship. Because um, let's be honest, a residency is job interview, right? So if I'm, if I'm a program director and I'm like, okay, I'm thinking about this candidate here. And I look at their board scores. I got the top board score in the country. Um, they're the smartest kid in their uh, class, but it turns out they're just an absolute prick. Um, I don't want to work with them for five years, right? So not not to diminish how important those things are, but they're not the most important thing. You know, research is something. Um, just figure out a way to get your name on something. You know, most of the research is horse shit. Um, you know, if you are fortunate enough, let's say if you're in medical school at University of Chicago where they're doing, where research is everywhere, you know, you can get your names on some papers pretty easily. If you're at a place like, you know, we got a med school here at CMU, it's not a big research university. So it's a lot more difficult to get your name on some research. But if you can get in a physiology lab or a biochemistry lab or a kinetics lab, like wherever you can get some experience doing it, um, I would tell you, try. Um, because it's it, at least you, you're not leaving those areas blank. There's actually there's a um, journal. It's called the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. And they actually write articles. Uh, and they have written articles. I, I can't tell you when it was, but um, but it's been over the last five years. Basically, though, kind of they had they interviewed program directors in the allopathic world and the, and the osteopath the same way um, about how they weigh the importance of all of those different things. You know, but, but I think kind of probably the best perspective is that it, it's a job interview, you know? So if, and that's, that's the real difference that residency is from being a student because the rubber meets the road in residency. You might be super smart, um, but if you have no hands, you know, it, it's a big difference saying someone can take a test and someone that can actually do, you know, operate. And so that's where it really, that's why um, it really peels off because if you can't, you know, if you're just not fast out with your hands, it's okay. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't matter if you were number one in all those things. If, you know, if you really struggle, uh, you know, with your hands, it, it could be a real problem. But I, I really think um, just, you know, be yourself, um, uh, listen, um, you know, be, be humble, uh, uh, be, 
be seen and not heard sometimes, you know what I mean? Like sometimes it's good to be there, like wait till they ask you stuff and then say something, you know, cause if you're just running in and you're chirping all the time, you know, to try to show how well read you are, like they notice that stuff and that's not really a positive all the time. Um, I think hard work is super important. Uh, one of the, one of my senior residents had gave some advice early on that I think is, was awesome. And basically, when you're going through your training, try to do the job of the person ahead of you. So when you're a student, look at what the interns are doing and try to do what they're doing. Now, don't try to show them up, you know what I mean? Try to do it in a gracious way with humility, but show that like you're prepared, show that you're working hard, show that you understand. And, and the other thing, so what will happen in your training is you'll get opportunities to do things. So when you get the opportunity, you want to make sure you do well. You know, it's kind of like if you're, playing football and you're trying to be the starting quarterback. You know what I mean? If you're not the starter, well, when you get your reps, do well. You know, it's like if you're going to do surgery, get your hands on um, some needle drivers, get your hands on some instruments and just uh, play with them all the time. Put them in your car. So when you're driving around, you're opening and closing needle drivers. You're, uh, it, you, you get very comfortable and facile using these things because what will happen is a student, you know, you'll be on your surgery rotation, they'll be in the middle of doing some big belly case, and then they have the clam somewhere, and they'll look at it and say, okay, tie this. And then all of a sudden, if you're like, ah, and you're pooping your pants in that moment because you never practiced, you know, and all the eyes are on you, um, it, it's not a great opportunity. But you're like, man, you know, I've, I've put in so many reps, um, tying sutures. Like, one thing you'll see in the hospitals, you take some suture and on your scrub, you know, where, the, where you tie the rope that goes around your waist, get the, uh, get some silk ties and just practice doing, uh, um, ties on that. You'll see like a lot of the surgery residents will have that. So when they have downtime, they'll just practice, 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 practice. There's a guy, um, you ever heard of Malcolm Gladwell? Unfortunately, no. So he's an author, wrote the book outliers. And there's this concept about 10,000 hours. So like to get good at stuff, you got to put in 10,000 hours. I think that's pretty accurate. You know, like LeBron James didn't get to be a good basketball player by just showing up, right? Like we also put in a hard work. You know, you take this someone that's doing, um, you know, surgery, any of those kind of things. It takes a lot of preparation. You know, their mentorships. You have to have a lot of experience and a lot of practice before they turn you loose on the community and let you do stuff to people. So this one. It, so even now, you know, if you're convinced you want to do surgery, get get a five finger discount on some of that stuff. You know, a ask one of the residents or ask. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the scrub techs or something say, Hey, I, I need a needle driver. Can you get me one? And they'll, they'll slip it to you. And then just literally as you're driving around in your car, for you to stop, stop light, pick it up, open, close it, right hand, left hand, you know, um, those things are, you know, that, that was some advice that was given to me early on. I thought it was really helpful. Interesting. Be thinking, Cause it, again, you just get real fast out with using those things. It's an important. So practice makes perfect network. And hard and it's not, but I mean, it's just, I, I really, I, I feel it's more on a personal level, you know, cause everyone's going to have the stuff on paper, right? So how do you set yourself apart? If you can figure out a way, um, you know, go in on the, that's, that's where the, like on the weekends, you know, the, you're in, you're at your base hospital. Um, you get to know some of the residents. You're like, Hey, can I shadow you on call? It's a Saturday morning, granny broke her hip. Well, those are the classic times, right? So yes, it's a pain in the ass to get up at seven o'clock on a Saturday and go to the hospital. But when you're coming in on your own free time and now it's just you, the resident and you know the attending that's the program director, now they got some opportunity. You know, hey, who are you? Oh, you answered, oh good. Well, thanks for coming in. You know, They see that, they notice that. And you know, and everyone in front of you had to do it too. It's just, um, the, the, the residency is very different from being a student. It's, it's work and it's hard work. And, and another thing that one of the um, residents had told me when I was an intern, which I thought was great advice, you'll never get in any trouble if you're on call and you get called at two in the morning and you get your ass out of bed and you go evaluate the patient, you start to initiate a treatment kind of plan and then it turns out you were wrong, right? I mean, you know, like nobody's going to die from that stuff necessarily, but you at least did the work. Whereas if you blow it off, you sleep, and then they call you at four, and now the patient's in a different set, you know, now, now you get yourself in trouble because you're just, you're being lazy. 
you know, so just, you know, it, it takes a lot of hard work, but don't back down from it. Really show that you're willing to work hard and put in the time and, those, you know, those things really pay off. Because everybody, you know, that, that how, how do you set yourself apart? You know, everyone's going to have all the prerequisites or most people, I mean, will have all the scores, all the, all the other stuff. So that's, that's where you can set yourself apart. I believe um, the, on the way you were speaking of will become a lot more important because with us, boards are becoming pass fail. Sure. So sure. that um, probably even more important. Uh, so how would you say COVID has impacted your practice? Oh, geez. Well, it was, um, it was really, I'm chief of staff right now. So um, when we were in the kind of the meat of the pandemic, quote unquote, it was going to the hospital every day so we didn't have to um you know we weren't doing any surgery we only did emergency surgeries so like if you know granny broke her hip or if someone had an ankle fracture things you had to do you know those kind of procedures let's say you're having a heart attack and they had to take you to the cath lab obviously you can't delay those kind of things but all elective cases were done so you know i do between 500 and 600 cases a year we went down to like doing almost nothing um and then, which was kind of great, because then I had, you know, office, we were seeing just kind of some, we only saw emergency patients or established patients, like one that we were already, had operated on, like, let's say if you had, you know, you had uh, broken your forearm and we fixed it, uh, and so we'd see it on the requisite follow-up visits, but if you can't, you know, we didn't see if you're like, hey, my shoulder started hurting two months ago. Well, you got to wait. So literally business slowed down but it was, it was kind of fun because it actually got to, I had a lot of time I don't normally have with my family and all of that stuff. And, and it kind of went as they figured that, because the, you know, the OR is the engine that drives the hospital. So I knew we'd be the first ones out of the chute when, you know, you know, when things kind of started looking up and that's, that's kind of how it went down. Um, so being in private practice, fortunate enough to get some of the PPP loans and those other things. So that was helpful in our part of your private practice. Like if you're not working, there's nothing coming in. So, whereas if you're employed, you know, you get vacation days, you get all these other stuff. When you're in private practice, you gotta make all that happen. So, um, and then as it kind of ramped back up, we started doing more and more. This fall was different. Normally in the fall, um, it's just, completely nuts because everyone's burned through their deductible so they want to get like their hips and knees done it was busy but it wasn't like years past because i think a lot of people were afraid to go to the hospital um one because they're just plain afraid you know because they you know well geez covid patients are there but you know i always tell me i said you're worse off going to menards or myers and you're going to the hospital because the hospital at least they're doing all the right stuff um but probably the more salient point is that they would have you know, significant others or loved ones that had other health problems, you know, say so like, yeah, I'd love to get my knee done, but my husband's got COPD and has a history of cancer. Like, I, I don't want to, um, you know, I don't, I, I, I can't put him, you know, him or her out, you know, so that's, so that factored in for a lot of people too. So it's still, um, and it's interesting now, because, you know, like I said, my wife does internal medicine and they're in these business meetings and they're like, well, you know, volumes are down. What, what, what's going on? And my, my wife, she goes, dipshits, you know, everyone's wearing masks and they're social distancing. Like nobody's getting the flu. They're not getting sick. So we kind of, we've been so kind of COVID crazy, right? Like the normal stuff that people normally get, they're not getting, right? How many, how much flu do you see now? We're not seeing much because everybody's, you know, the, the, the benefits of us doing all the social distancing are where the flu numbers aren't as high. So, and, and we're in kind of an economy where it's all kind of procedure-based and sickness-based, uh, unfortunately, um, but it's just kind of how it is. So now a lot of the revenue is down for medicine. So it's interesting to see that side of it because, you know, the administrators are all scratching their heads. They're like, well, well, well where is everybody? Well, people aren't getting as sick, right? I mean, they're just not. <laughs> so, and, and, and you generate, you know, most of the business is generated from sickness, right? So yeah, it, no, it's an interesting space right now for medicine, <laughs> for sure. So that's interesting. I didn't even really think about that too much. Well, I didn't either. And my wife had said it, and it was like, 
when you say it, it's like, duh, you know, like, well, and think about it in other cultures too, they'll actually wear masks when they're sick because they actually think about other people. We're not like that in our country. You know, we're kind of more focused on just, we don't see past the end of our nose. But, but imagine if you had that, you know, if I knew that I was sick and I said, well, hell, I don't want to give to everybody. So if I simply wore a mask, you know, that could be a real game changer. You know, you, know, you, you might not make people sick. And then as someone that takes care of people that are elderly with great frequency, you need to protect these folks, you know, it's important. So um, well, hopefully um, our culture can learn some things from this pandemic. Uh, my fingers crossed, but I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I, I think you're right, because the, the, the other, and I don't want to get too in the weeds on this stuff, but, you know, the, the, the thing that I, I say to a lot of people, it's like, you know, the, the part that I marveled at when the pandemic was really going on, you know, you had the CEO of Beaumont Hospital writing articles in the free press about how they might go bankrupt. You know, this is Beaumont Hospital. I mean, one of the biggest health systems and one of the richest zip codes in the country. Like, if they're vulnerable, like, what's everybody else look like, you know? So hopefully everyone's eyes can kind of be open to this. We can take a deep breath and actually do what's important. Cause that's, what's cool about doing what we do. I mean, it's just, it's an absolute blessing to provide care for people. I mean, you kind of, you get, you spend so much time learning about diseases and things, but the, the cool part is when you're in practice, when you actually get to talk to people and you help them, you know, like, like one of my favorite procedures do is a total hip. Because, man, you, you change their lives. They can't do shit because their hip hurts so bad. They're miserable. Their quality of life sucks. You fix their hip and their back doing all the things they enjoy. They're super happy. You know? I mean, I've had I've had uh, what a the patient of mine. It was great. He just he said it was a really cool moment. He just said, you know, Mike, I'm so glad I met you. You know, or you do surgery on friends. You, you make them better. You help. It, it's just a cool feeling to be in that position to be able to help people like that. You know, that's what medicine's about not about at least from my perspective i mean it's really neat when people bring their family to you you know hey my kids hurt can you help them yeah you know that's a pretty cool space to be in because not everybody gets that you know yeah and if you like you fix um help the father and then the kid later gets hurt then you have people coming back to you and that's well but it's neat you know what i mean like you, you, like your, your friends you know like oh, yeah of course yeah, yeah it's one that's not you know and, it, it, and it's true in any other industry i suppose too i mean if you're an accountant hey can you do my mom's taxes that would feel pretty cool um but it's just it, it's neat um because you, you meet people um where they're in some pretty vulnerable spaces you know like what i you know you did i did a rotation in orthopedic oncology you know, you want to talk about a tough conversation, walk into a room uh, with a five-year-old kid and the parents and tell them they got osteosarcoma of their femur, the five-year-old, you know what I mean? Those are powerful conversations to witness and be part of, you know, and you get to do those things in medicine. You know, it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty special space in society that we get to do, you know, and don't lose sight of that. We get lost in all the other crap. You know, at the end of the day, you're taking care of people and that's what's important. Do you deal with a lot of um, like bone cancers and stuff like that? No, well, I mean, bone cancers themselves are very uncommon. Mo the most common thing would be a metastasis from somewhere else. But yeah, you see it. I mean, it's, you know, it's not, um, you don't do a lot, but you, you do it, you know. You know I, I just I remember, because um, you were just mentioning it, and then my, my girlfriend actually had osteosarcoma when she was 18. Sure, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's a real big deal. You get that, you're like, oh, geez. Um, now, the, the things that they can do now with limb salvage and the treatment, like, holy cow, uh, the prognosis for a lot of those things are way better than they used to be in the past. But, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, my college roommate, his dad actually uh, broke his arm when he was unloading suitcases out of the car and he had a pathologic fracture of his humerus, you know, so that, I had the opportunity to explain to him all like, look, I, I don't know what you got, but this is no good. You know, you got a pathologic fracture. Like, and these are people I know really well, you know, it's just, um, it's a weird space. Cause you know, this is my college room. It was one thing when you're some dummy undergrad student, but it's another thing when you, you know, you evolve to be a professional and have it, you know, have a different perspective on it, you know? Interesting. Yeah. So no, I mean, it, it, it doesn't, I don't, I think any field of surgery is pretty great. And I don't mean to diminish medicine in any way either, because they, they all have their 
space too, but the, the surgical subspecialty is just, it's awesome. Interesting. Uh, what made you go towards um, private practice? Uh, just the opportunity. Um, I didn't go out seeking it. Um, just in Mount Pleasant, the group they were at, they were in private practice. So they were gracious enough to allow me to join their practice. Um, the downside of that is that, you know, most of what I've learned in business are from running into a wall, um, you know, because they don't teach you any of that. Um, but what's nice about being in private practice is the autonomy. Uh, you know, I don't have to answer to anybody, which is kind of nice. Um, but but private practice is a bit of a dinosaur now. It's it's a lot it's a lot less common just because there's so you know with EMRs and all the other kind of infrastructure stuff you have to have to practice medicine. It's it's cost prohibitive almost unless you're in a bigger group. So I guess what kind of advice would you give to someone who wanted to start their own private practice? Maybe not necessarily. You, you, you can, you can, but let's say you want to do orthopedics, right? So you want to buy uh, x-ray equipment. You're talking, you know, three, 400 grand easy. You want to buy an EMR, another three, 400 grand. You know, like, so it gets to big numbers pretty fast. Whereas if you, you know, you join a group and they're like, hey, we'll pay you a salary. You get 401k, we'll match all this stuff. Like, oh, okay, that's a lot. And all that stuff's already there because they figured it out. I don't, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but it's, um, you know, I'm certainly jealous of some of the people that are employed because they get actual vacation days. But it's nice being in private practice because I can run a lot of things through my business that I wouldn't be able to do if I was employed. You know, like I get cell phones for my family. I have my car through my business. I have, uh, you know, if you travel to some meetings, you can write some stuff off. I mean, it's just so... Um, you don't have those opportunities if you're employed. So there, there's pros and cons to it, but. Is there um, any like uh, legal or um, business resources that your practice uses a lot that helped in the establishment of it? I don't know if you would know that. The, the corporation structure, I mean, like I, when I did, I worked with my accountant, um, you know, I did, or you can have an attorney help you, but it's just uh, the, probably the, one of the challenging things you first start up, you got to get contracts with all the insurance companies and that takes time um so it takes a while like you'll uh for instance when our, our young, younger partner my uh partner's son joined us you know you know the first few months you know you don't participate with most insurance plans because it just takes time so you're working in, in the revenue streams kind of lagging behind so it's not uncommon that either the, the group or a hospital would give you some sort of income guarantee so that you at least have a personal income while everything's kind of getting caught up. And then it all catches up later on the backside because it just takes a while to get those things going. Now, I can't remember if you said this earlier, but do you guys have your own like center where you do all your surgery? Or do you guys still do surgery at the hospital? No, we don't. We do most of it at the hospital, but it, it, it's just a small, I, in Mount Pleasant, a smaller town to open up a surgery center and directly compete with the hospitals. I don't really have a passion for um, cause you know, the, the way I pray, it's like the, the lady that's the head orthopedic nurse lives right next to my parents. So I didn't really want to be the guy that made her lose her job, you know, cause they opened a surgery center. So just personally, wasn't that important to me. but if you're in other towns, yeah, I mean, there are great opportunities for ancillary income. I have friends that are, um, you know, owners or, you know, part owners in surgery centers, they, they run more efficiently because, you know, the, the doctors are the one making decisions and there's all sorts of literature that say they do it better. It's more efficient, you know, um, and it, it's, it's big, there's a lot of push to have things go that way because um, hospitals are more expensive. Um, you know, the surgery centers are kind of more leaner and meaner, but it's just here in a small town. It's just a, um, you know, just doesn't quite work. Bigger yeah, town, I, sure. I know my um my hometown Port Huron has um orthopedic associates. And, oh yeah, yeah. And they just send everybody. You go to the hospital if you think you broke something. They they'll give you X-rays. They'll split it, but they tell yeah. you to go to the orthopedic associates in the morning. Yeah, yeah no, we had actually started this before the COVID. We started, and it was uh the the guy Ken Easton that runs orthopedic associates. It's a friend of mine. We modeled after what they do. What they have a, a we call it. They, they, there's there's it was like a, a AOM now. So they like an orthopedic urgent clinic and we modeled ours pretty much exactly after how they did it. We asked them if they minded if we copied them. They said they didn't. Um, but that's another common thing too. And I think it's, it's a better 
uh, better care for the patients rather than have them, you know, if your kid falls, hurts their wrist and you go to an urgent care, they go, I don't know what you did. You know, here's a splint. Give me 400 bucks, go see ortho. You know, you're better off just going to see ortho right out of the chute. Yeah, you, know, you, you, you want your kind of definitive answer. Uh, yeah, it turns out you broke your arm. No, you don't need surgery, you know. And th that's the other thing that's really changed over my career. You know, medicine used to be, I called it like you had your dad's credit card. You know, if you go out to the bar and you're buying rounds of drinks, it's your dad's credit card. You know, there's no skin in the game, so nobody cared and everybody's having fun. But now that people have big co-pays and big deductibles, I mean, it's not uncommon to have patients with $10,000 deductibles. But when they're paying their actual money, they're paying a lot more attention. So they're pissed if they got a $200 office bill, you know, and you quote unquote, didn't do anything, right? So that, uh, it's, so now it's much more relevant than it might've been 10 years ago. So if you can have them skip that step where they go to an urgent clinic and not that, you know, the urgent clinics are doing their best, but they're not designed to provide definitive treatment. You know, they're just designed to kind of stabilize stuff and move along. Well, if, you know, if it's musculoskeletal stuff, you're better off going to the orth orthopedic urgent clinics because you, you get the, like I said, you get the kind of expert opinion right out of the shoe. And patients really like it. And we've got a lot of, that was going doing really well and then COVID hit and blew that all up. So, because um, you can't, now we can't really have people just walk right in off the street, right? Um, so, but I mean, that'll get back to normal here soon enough. But. Um, question from the audience. Um, what's your relationship like with the anesthesiologists that you work with? Oh, really good. They're a good friend of mine. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, okay. not, um, you know, this uh, very collegial. Um, you know, they help you out a lot. Um, could you speak to non-compete agreements in ortho slash surgery in general? Are they common? Do you know any people who have issues with them? Well, if you're employed, yeah, pretty much any, any. So if I hire you and I say, hey, come to town and then we give you a bunch of money and then we give you a bunch of resources and time to help you build your practice. And then you decide, you know, Mike, I don't like you. I'm going to go hang a shingle. Well, it's very common for hospitals or groups for that matter to say, Hey, you know what? Um, you know, they kind of take the perspective. You're not going to be as busy right out of the shoot if you don't have kind of our hospital name or our group name behind you. So um, you have to go 70 miles away. It's usually the number somewhere like that. So you got if you're going to leave us, that's cool, but you just got to go somewhere else. Because what we don't, what they don't want to do is invest a bunch of time, resources, and you get you up and going, and then you take patients away from. It, is essentially what it is. So that's okay. where the non competes come from. But they're, uh, it's interesting because we actually we were working with this attorney once, and and it was funny because the attorney said this one attorney we were that left his group, and. Um, and so we're still working with them. We're like, hey, don't you guys have no competes? And he goes, oh no, we think they're unethical. They're like, oh great. So the attorneys think they're unethical, but the non-competes are totally commonplace in medicine. Uh, they can really tie your hands. Now, the way you get around those is let's say if a hospital hires you, if you went into private practice, that's not considered competing, right? But if you went to work for a competing health system or a competing group, that's absolutely considered competing. And then they'll, and it would cost you a lot of time, money and resources to fight it. Um, th there's always the phrase they say, they quote unquote, don't hold up. But if you're paying an attorney three or 400 bucks an hour, good luck. Cause they'll, you know, if you're, let's say if you're going up against McLaren health system, I think McLaren's bank is going to be much bigger than Dr. Jones's bank. You know what I mean? Like, so they can, they can wait that out. So non-competes can kind of tie your hands a bit but one thing that actually if, if you can do it I, I don't know why you'd want to do it but if you can bounce around kind of from place to place in your practice um so let's say every three four years you move somewhere else you know you have somebody we and throw you a bunch of money to recruit you uh that can work out pretty well but that's hard to do you know you're not going to go to your kids when they're in school you know fifth grade seventh grade and junior year and be like hey we're all moving to montana you know you, your kids will go nuts and so but but if you if you let's say if you were single and you were able to do that uh, you could do pretty well for yourself because hospitals will lay out a lot of money to recruit you to get you to come there especially some of the areas that are kind of outliers that are just 
you know, people don't necessarily want to go to, um, you know, you can do pretty well if you go to some of those underserved areas. Because everybody wants to live in Denver, right? How many people in their leaving residency, like, I want to go work in Denver? Well, pretty much everybody. But how many people want to go out in the sticks in North Dakota? Maybe not everybody, you know, so you can, so that those jobs will typically kind of pay you more or, you know, they might pay off your med school loans or they might do all sorts of stuff for you. And that, that, that those can be things to think about. You, you know, some people join the military service and then hold them so many years of service afterwards in exchange for their, uh, you know, med school stuff. Um, some hospitals are paid or some smaller hometowns. I've seen things like that where the, you know, the, your town will, you know, you know, throw you some money while you're in training in exchange for you agreeing to come there to do some work when you're done. That's not a bad deal. Because some of the debt you guys have now, it's unbelievable. Well, I, no, I'm, not, I'm not joking. Like my friend's sister-in-law they just finished dental school and like the amount of debt she was in is unbelievable. I mean, we had plenty when we were finished 20 years ago, but I can only imagine what it's like for you guys now. I mean, it's no joke. Yeah, it's um, it's well, you know, but, but it's, it's for real. I mean, think about it. It's, it's like if you start your job, say, okay, now you got a cottage. I mean, that's what it, and you know, when you got to pay that back, and that's the other that's the reason doctors get sued is because they're collectible. So it's not like you're going to be able to get out of that debt. You know, if you're saddled with four hundred thousand dollars in debt, you know, that's going to weigh down for a long time. But if you can, you know, maybe make less money for the first three, four years, but if the, you know, the, whatever entity is paying you a bunch of cash so you can hammer that debt away and be done with it. That's a great plan. Cause you'll make plenty. Um, but if you're saddled with a bunch of debt, it's, a, it can overwhelm you. Um, a different question, kind of changing gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. How did you, um, decide which programs to rotate at, um, or your experience with audition rotations? Student. I kind of tried to do stuff that I thought was fun. I actually did an extra rotation. I did trauma surgery at Cook County in Chicago. So it was a completely extra rotation just because I knew it'd be cool to go there and just, they, you know, to, like, it, you know, Cook County was at that, was the first trauma unit in the country. I mean, it was just, and it was completely nuts and it was fun. Kind of got to check that box. Uh, but as a resident, I tried, or as a student, tried to identify the programs where I thought I might want to go train. So I made sure to do a month there. Um, you know, at, at Genesis, obviously, it was my base hospital, so I wasn't concerned about that. But like, I did a month in Lansing and I did a where else did I go? I think there was a couple other out rotations. But, um, you know, I tried to identify the places where I thought I might want to apply because, again, get back where I said before, it's you got to get more of a personal connection for stuff because um, it's really it's a job interview. You know, they, they want to know, hey, can I work with this person? for five years. So your, I mean, your board scores and all those things are important. Grades are important, but at the end of the day, they want to know, can they, are, are you teachable? Are, are you, is it, are you someone they want to work with? You know, are you good with patients? I mean, those are the things that are the most important. Uh, do you deal with um, paying employees, um, typically yourself, or do you guys outsource that? No, to... no we have, a, no, we have, 50, I, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know exactly how many employees we have, but no, I mean, it's, we try to make our place a nice place to work. We all, my partners, I have family is very important. Um, we want people want to be there. Uh, the hard, the challenge we have being a private practice, we can't pay like hospitals pay. You know, we've had nurses that say at the hospital make 28 bucks an hour or whatever the number is. You know, we can't afford to do that in private practice, but in exchange for that, it's like, Hey, if you're like, you know, my daughter's got a volleyball game and I want to go. Yeah, go, you know, like, so we try to just make it an environment that, yeah, you might not break the bank because of what we pay it. Cause you can, you know, we can only afford so much, you know, so that that's one of the strains of kind of private practice, um, you know, is having employees and they're expensive, um, you know, healthcare costs are expensive for employees. I mean, we have those conversations very regularly. If we hire someone and say they're, uh, married or in a relationship with someone that can provide insurance for them, we're probably more likely to hire them so that at least we don't have to pay for their insurance because it's a big cost of doing business. Uh, providing healthcare for your employees is very expensive. That's across any industry. I mean, any, you ask any small business owner, 
what it's like to provide insurance for their employees and their panties get bunched up. I mean, it's a, it's a common problem for everybody. Um, the question that I have, um, doctors being sued, how, how would you or how have your colleagues handled that in the past? Um, you know, if you do surgery, you're going to get sued, so get over it. Um, don't be afraid of it. Um, it's, it, you hear it and it, I, I don't know the exact stats, but it's my understanding. If you actually follow cases through that went to court, the, the overwhelming majority of them find in favor of the physician. So everybody quote unquote practices defensive medicine, but the reality is um, if you have good relationships with people, um, you know, so here's a great line. I was at a, I was at a meeting and one of the surgeons said, look, if you talk to a surgeon that says they don't have any complications, they're either lying or they don't do enough surgery. So you're going to have, like I had a friend of mine that was a GI doc and he did a colonoscopy and he perfed the colon and ruptured the spleen and he was all worked up. And I'm like, dude, how many colonoscopies do you do in a year? You know, you might do, pick a number, I don't know, 3,000. And if you perf one, so the whole thing about getting sued is if you violate the standard of care. So if you're doing what is the standard of care in your community, which like the, a normal physician, specialist, surgeon would do, and as long as you follow the right steps, you don't, they can, they can sue you all you want, but you're safe, right? Because you haven't violated the standard of care. But if you practice good medicine, you know, you practice good orthopedics, you know, so if we're talking orthopedics, you practice good orthopedics, you know, do what's the normal accepted stuff, um, you know, you, you're not really vulnerable. I mean, you, you will get sued. Um, it'll happen, but it's not, it, it's probably more common when you're really in your practice. Um, but the other reality is too, when you have strong, robust relationships with your patients, they'll tolerate a lot of stuff too, you know? Hey, th th this happened. I, you know, it was a mistake. Um, I'm sorry. You know, there was a classic uh, paper out of U of M where if doctors literally took a minute to say they're sorry when an adverse event happened, like it was a huge deal and it avoided litigation a lot of times. So you just, um, it, it's kind of part of what you do. Don't be afraid of it. Um, if you do, you know, if you do OB, if you do surgery, you're, you're going to get sued. Just kind of, you got to find your space in there and move past it. Can't let it overwhelm you. That's what you get malpractice insurance for. <laughs> You know, and it's not that common. It's really not. If, if you're, and again, the, really the key with the lawsuit stuff is that, did you violate the standard of care? If you didn't, you're protected. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I was always curious. About well, you that. know, like, like my buddy is a GI doc. Like, uh, if you do enough colonoscopies, you're going to perf a colon from time to time. It happens. It's a known complication. Now, if it turns out that you're a GI doc that perfs 70% of the colonoscopies, you're probably going to find some trouble if your person if your perforation rates super low um that's well within the standard right i mean sometimes things are going to happen you know hey i, I went to bend the fever and it, we you know this broke or this happened or the, hey i put a drill bit in somebody the drill bit broke stop you know shit happens right i mean it just it, it does but you just you can't you can't practice and be afraid of it that's for sure I mean, as long as you're doing the, the stuff you're trained to do, do it in the right way, do it in an ethical way, you, you establish good relationships with your patients, you're going to be more than okay. We're about at our time, but um, two last quick questions. One, how do you handle addressing a possible career-ending um, career injuries with like athletes? Well, okay, great, talk, great question. I'll give you a great example. I had a patient that was a gymnast in college. She was a junior. Um, she had had, at this time, she'd already had four shoulder surgeries, right? Prior to this. And I, I, you finally kind of just said it very candidly, but and as empathetic as I can try to be, I guess, and just said, look, you know, for gymnastics in particular, if you're a college gymnast, you're probably already packed because everything in gymnastics in around the Olympics, right? Which is about a 16 year old. They get a hit when you're 16. So even in college gymnastics, great opportunities. There's no one tougher than college gymnasts, by the way, because I've operated in all college athletes. Like them and wrestlers are in a league of their own. They're just tough as nails. And, and they, um, but 
you know, I, I'd asked this young lady, I said, you know, what do you study to be? So to be a teacher, you know, I said, I, I kind of take the half full perspective of the cup, right? You've had this great experience in gymnastics. It provided you an opportunity to compete at a high level at, at a division one university. It provided you an education, you know, if, if the fact that, you know, you miss your senior year, yeah, does it, does it suck? Yeah, on some level it does, but but kind of look at everything that it brought you to this point though too. You know, it's not like you're going to be a professional gymnast, right? And they're, they're careful conversations, but because it, it, you know, these career ending things can be very difficult to hear, but that's part of being an athlete too. Athletes get hurt, right? I mean, you know, you can, it, it, it wouldn't take much to name great athletes that had something happen that kind of messed it all up. You know, those things are common. So it's just, I, I mean, I think sports are important, but we got we got to keep in the appropriate kind of paradigm too, you know, I mean, or too. And it's like I'd said to this young lady, I said, look, you don't know much about orthopedics. I said, but what are the odds that your fifth surgery is going to make you better? You've already had four, right? I mean, if, if you've had more than one surgery for the same problem, I, you know, your, your odds of success are greatly diminished. I, mean, I don't care what it is. You know, like sometimes you have to have more than one, but if you're getting in, you know, into multiple procedures for the same problem, it means you got a bad problem, right? So. Well, cool. Thanks for touching on that. And the last one you kind of already touched on earlier, but how do you acknowledge the threshold of too much work that ends up not being beneficial anymore? Well, um, so let's say if I'm at work all the time and I'm coming home late, and I'm grumpy, and I end up divorced, and my kids are smoking weed and dropping out of school, uh, is it really worth it? You know what I mean? Or you, your kids hate, I mean, everybody's targets, uh, you know, you got to figure out what's important to you. Uh, it, it's a great job, but I, I tell people all the time, there's no ceiling to the hard work, and they, they'll, and so, and you can give and give, or they can, your employer can take and take and take, but you got to be happy. You know, and I, I know you guys, you don't have, it doesn't take much to find some physician that's completely miserable. Okay. And it's because it gets kind of lost in the weeds. It like, you have to have a work-life balance. It's super important in medicine, especially now, you know, and that's a moving target for everybody else. You know, like uh, it was really important for, you know, my wife is, I always say she's the smart one. I'm just the guy that fixes stuff, you know, but it was important for her. Um, she wanted to be available to be able to take our kids to school. It was important for her to be able to pick the kids up from school. So she's truncated her hours at work um, because that was important for her. But th th that's, it's a really great thing, right? Um, and, and I always hesitate because I hate to say that she works part-time because she doesn't. She's just as, if you look at her numbers, she's as productive in the time that she's at work as the male physicians are that are working, quote unquote, full time. So if she's doing her job and she's doing it actually better than the guys are. Uh, but for her, it was important for the family part. Thank God, because, you know, it's, it, it, you know, I, I can be the mule out there, um, you know, with longer hours and doing that. So it works better for our family. But at the end of the day, it, it, it's got to work. You know, and, and at the end of the day, when you get up in the morning, you want to be happy to go to work, you know, and, and, and especially the longer you do it, I mean, it's physically taxing. That's why I think it's important to, you know, eat well, exercise. I mean, you got to take care of yourself too. You know, they always say doctors are the worst patients, right? But if you look, if you're, if you're sacrificing your own health and your own well being for a couple of bucks, you know, I say all the time, like, if you can't figure out how to live on a couple hundred grand a year, you should probably have your ass beat, right? So as I don't care what you do in medicine, you're going to make some decent money. But, but make sure, um, you know, don't, don't get so lost in stuff that that's all you're doing is working, trying to make more, you're never going to be rich, you know, not like, you know, Jeff Bezos rich, you know what I mean? Like there's rich folks out there and none of them, you know, very few, nobody's doing medicine, you know, medicine, you're going to get paid well, 
you're going to get a lot of respect, but also modify your lifestyle too, in a way that um, you're, you're not just some rat on a hamster because that, that'll destroy it. It really does. I think that's a great ending note um, too, that like, that's really important for people to know that. So thank you very much, Dr. Yeah, no for coming out and it was really great. Yeah. Um, Addie, you wanted to say some words? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. It's been great. This is actually like our first event as a club, yeah. as our new e-board putting on. So we really, really appreciate you coming out. Yeah, yeah. No, happy to help however I can. So I really appreciate it. It was, it was great. No worries. Very no. information. No good information. Yeah, no, if you ever need any help or need anything, or if you guys ever want to rotate or, uh, or you got questions anytime, just let me know. Happy to help. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming out, making our um, event a success. The book that he mentioned, Outliers, there is a link in the chat for the Amazon of that, if anybody's interested in that. Um, if anybody has any closing comments or you know, wants to reach out to Musatsun, go ahead and reach out to ACOS and we can get, we can get you guys um, hooked up. But thank you very much.